As the director of Do the Right Thing, Malcolm X, and Jungle Fever, Spike Lee has never shied away from tackling the subject of race in America. In his new film, Bamboozled, Damon Wayans stars as a Harvard-educated executive writing for a failing television network. After several of his concepts fail to go into production, he creates a modern-day minstrel show, and guess what? It becomes a hit. Yell out! I am not going to take it anymore! I don't want anything to do with anything black for at least a week. I am pleased to have Spike Lee back at this table. Welcome back. Thank you. <laughs> Thank you. I got caught off guard a little bit. You were daydreaming, weren't you? I didn't know we were You were daydreaming. Rolling. Mm -hmm. All right, look, here it is. Spike's film arrived. Guess what? <laughs> Stanley Crouch. Well, Stanley, I mean, come on, this is a pal. No, it's not. Uh, he, that's, this is the first film he's ever liked, ever. <laughs> the most innovative and telling social satire ever brought to the American screen. Mm. That, and also, I might add, that's the sanitized ad because New York Times wouldn't accept the other one. What would the other one have looked like? We had we had two. One had a picking and eating a piece of watermelon. The other one had Tommy and Saving Blackface, but their faces were bigger. <laughs> you. <laughs> All right, let, let, this is a... Tell me what's going on here. Why did you make this movie? What did you want to say? What offended you? Is this a one more time of Spike saying, look, this is really awful and I'm going to make a movie about it to make my point? Well, this is a, this is a satire. I mean, as, as Mark Twain showed, you know, a satire is a good way to, to look at things in a satirical light. And this film looks at popular culture, the images of African Americans, how they've been used to sell products, stereotypes, in the last hundred years. So as I was writing this film was really at the time, you know, where we getting ready to go into another millennium, leaving another, I thought it'd be a good time to, to look back, look presently, and see where we are, where we might be going in the future. And what do you say to those people who say, look, if you want to send a message, go to Western Union? Well I don't know who should entertain us, Spike. Well there everybody has their own calling. You know, and I'm an artist, and I feel it is my right to tell. I think all good directors are storytellers, and these are stories I want to tell. And every, you know, these, this is what I want to do. So people either come or they don't. As simple as that. A couple of things about the movie. First of all, you say very clearly right at the top, satire. Right. You give us a definition of satire. Webster's. Webster's definition. It's a definitive <laughs> definition of, of satire. You want us to know this is satire coming? Yes. I did that for the critics. Because they would jump all over <laughs> you? Because they, they misunderstand a lot of stuff, so I put that up front. <laughs> Even on being criticized for, for being, he, he, he bags us over the head. He even put the definition of, of satire <laughs> at the beginning of the movie. They did say that. Mm -hmm. <laughs> um, you want us to watch this movie? Yes and leave that theater with an uncomfortable sense of how it was for black entertainers and, but, and what they had to go through and how demeaning it was. At the same time, I think that it's also showing that those images affect everybody and they're still with us. And I hope this film also shows, if I was successful, is that nowadays in the 21st century, you don't necessarily have to wear black, you don't have to wear blackface to still be in a menstrual act. Tell me the story. The story is simple. Pierre Delacroix, played, <laughs> Pierre by, Delacroix, Dan, right. by, da, played by Damon, Damon Wayans. Wayans, is a struggling, the lone African-American writer, TV writer at this upstart CNS. WB-like network. WB-UPN like that, and Fox when he started. And he's urged by his boss, played by Michael Rappaport, that he has to come up with something there in the bottom of the ratings. Consistently, De La Croix's efforts, what he feels to portray dignified African Americans in a sitcom, are rejected. He wants out. But if he quits, he's going to be fired. I mean, if he quits, he's going to be sued. So in order to get his money, he has to, come, he has to be fired. So like in the producers, Mel Brooks' film, right. 
with Gene Wilder and Joe Mostel, he thinks up the most racist, offensive show he can, knowing for sure that would be fired, his butt be on the street. Lo and behold, CNS likes it. They shoot the pilot. It goes on the air, becomes the number one show in America. Big hit. Blackface becomes a rage. Everybody's doing it. Everybody's doing it, and Pierre Delacroix has become Dr. Frankenstein. And what's the nature of the relationship he has with his lady? Oh, played by Jada Pinkett. Right. Uh, sort of like the the Girl Friday thing, but it, it gets tricky when she comes to understanding that her hands are bloody and this thing's going to turn out ugly. Critics have said, I've, I've read very good reviews of this, mm -hmm. some people... See, I knew this going in, Charlie, that either it's going to be very hard for people to be on the fence in this one. Either people are going to like it very much or they're going to hate it. And I think I was right in that, <laughs> in that observation. But do you like that? It's, it's not I mean, in other words, you want a reaction to your movies. You don't want them to say... It, it really depends on... You don't the, want them to ignore you. It, it really depends on the film, Charlie. I think with a subject matter like this, it's too volatile to think that you're going to get a landslide of approval. This film, I think, makes a whole lot of these critics guilty. And, and, and their reviews, in my estimation, they're not dealing what the film's about, about the history of... Hollywood and television and the misrepresentations of people of color. They don't deal with they, they don't deal with it. They talk about everything else. That final montage for me, that's that's some of the most powerful okay. filmmaking I've ever done, and they don't even touch that. I don't have that here, but but explain that. That's at the end of the film in which you show almost in a documentary fashion. Right. Tell me about that. Well, at the end of the film, we show we did massive, massive research, but we have a great researcher named is Judy. Ailey, and we show Birth of a Nation, Amos and Andy, Mantan Morland, Stephen Fetchett, Judy Garland. And Blackface. And Blackface, uh, Al Jolson, Eddie Cantor. And we, we were just trying to show the depths to which this, this madness, you know, got What's to. What's the history of it, though? You know, there's a, it was a long time ago. It's appropriate, and thank God there's someone who wants to do this. Mm -hmm. But what's the consequences today? Are there remnants of the implications yes. of or the experience of blackface in the way the entertainment world works in the year 2000? I think so. I think there are a lot of TV shows that are, are menstrual shows. I think some forms of gangs, the, the, the genre gangster, gangster rap, if you look at those videos, I think that's a form of modern day menstrual shows. So, as I said before, in the 21st century, you don't have to blacken up for us this, this, some of this stuff still to be happening, in my opinion. How hard was it to make the movie? Very hard. New Line Pictures, thank God. Mike DeLuca, Bob Shea, Bob Lynn, they were the only one in the world that was going to finance it. The story is you went to about 10 studios and they all turned it down. More than that. And, and was the, it because they didn't want to spend the amount of money that you wanted to spend, they, or was they, it more because they thought, fight, this movie's not going to make any money? And it's, not gonna make, it's not going to make any money. We don't need this. We don't need this. I, like in the film, I don't want Sharp and Johnny Cochran leading pickets outside yeah, right. the studio gates. So you got Al Sharp in the movie. They, we don't want NWCP, you know, t calling me. I don't want Crazy calling me up. And then we had some funny stories like, well, if you get Will Smith and Leonardo and they could do it for scale, then we'll give you $8 million. <laughs> yeah. If you get them for scale, we'll do it. <laughs> <laughs> and they were serious. <laughs> oh, I'm sure they were. <laughs> These are guys that get $25 million a each pop. a yeah. pop. Yeah, but so does people like Eddie Murphy, doesn't he? And, and uh, I mean, Martin Lawrence and mm -hmm. people like that. Yeah. Let me tangent off here for okay. a second. What's, this year has been very good. Eddie Murphy made over $100 million for his movie. Lawrence Wayne's, made more than $100 million for his. Scary Movie. Scary Movie made $150 million. Martin with Big Mama's House. Right. I think this summer... What does that say? These are black filmmakers. No, 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 not black filmmakers. What Keen else? is only black filmmakers. These are black comedians who right. are huge of you, of you, of you stars. I'm very happy. It says that black comedians have reached levels that they've never reached before. And it's great.
You know what I've always wanted you to do? What's that? I've always wanted you to make a movie about Richard Pryor's life. That's what I want you to do. Mm -hmm. I had discussions with Martin Scorsese. He was supposed to like, produce that, but I didn't like the I, script. I never knew that. Is that right? Yeah, I was he, just he going out of the blue. He I still, have, always he still has a right script. Why would that not interest you? Oh, it did. I just didn't like the script. So, change the script. Well, it wasn't mine to change because I didn't own the property. The property was owned by Scorsese. And well, then manager. can't you go make your own movie about Richard Pryor? Not if they bought the rights. They own his life? That's what did. No, no, I thought you'd go buy another book. I mean, find another book that's about no, his life. But and you can't. I you mean, that exactly what happened in, in the story of, of uh, Malcolm X. There were a bunch of books out there. I know, but Marvin Worth bought the rights from Alex Haley and the late yeah. Dr. Betty Shabazz. So it'd be very hard. You have, you have to have no conscience at all to make a film on Malcolm X when you didn't, knowing that. His widow sold the right to somebody else. Them too, yeah. yeah, I wouldn't I would, I would touch that. You wouldn't do that? No. Do you have any regrets about that movie at all? Mm -mm. The, Charlie, the only regret I have for all the films I've done was the first one. She's going to have it. There's a rape scene in that film that today I would not put in. Too blatant. It was just stupid on my part. I was young and what dumb. What do you mean it was, it was, it, it, there was gratuitous? No, it was gratuitous. There was no need to have that scene in there. Yeah. How has marriage changed you? Well, you read the papers, I'm still angry. So. <laughs> <laughs> I know. I don't think... <laughs> uh, it, it's made me... It much... hasn't mellowed you at all, has it? It's made you me... You take a... your kids to the to the Knicks games? Uh, it's made me a, a much better person. Has it really? Yes, yeah, made me complete. My have great you? wife, Tanya, we have two wonderful kids, Satchel and Jackson, and it's the best thing that ever happened to me. But... Uh... That's the truth, Tanya. <laughs> anything, you wanna, anything you wanna say to her while you're here with me at this table? Ah, I love you, Tony. Yeah. <laughs> love Satchel and Jax. You know, we have uh, Satchel been... named after Satchel Page. Yes. And Jax named after. That's my my middle name. Jax Jackson. Jackson. Oh, Jackson. Mm -hmm. uh -huh. So, very happy in it. You know, I, I feel blessed. I have a great family, wonderful wife, and I'm doing what makes me happy. Is us making films, and I say this all the time. Because nine, nine as you know. 99% of people in this world go to their grave having slaved at the job all their lives that they hate it. I'm making a speech and, about and that tonight. We're lucky. Yeah, we're know. doing what we love. Yeah. Uh, but have you mellowed at all? Has age, has no, what, experience? No, what, what, age, what age has done is told me that I cannot speak out about every single injustice in the world. So now I choose. It may not seem like that, but I, I pick my <laughs> spots. But there is rage inside of you. I think there should be rage inside of every conscious human being in the world because there's stuff that's just not right. And I, don't, I, I really understand this thinking that if you achieve a certain level of success, fame, power, power, leverage. that means it's time to shut the F up, sit back, chill by the pool and count your bank account. And I can't do no, that. No, I mean, what it means is you ought to use that leverage and that power and that fame to do the kinds of things that are most precious to you. And that's what I do. Jamie Foxx said this about mm -hmm. you. Have you seen this quote? Yeah, I've seen it. With the most respect I can give him, I think he needs to back off a little. Mm -hmm. I think it's getting to the point where nobody cares because he talks about it so much that now he's just become the angry guy, the mm -hmm. angry mm -hmm. black. I read that quote, and I thought that it was kind of funny because that quote, from what I'm told, took place at the press junket for his new film, Bait, and a critic told him, Spike Lee says that some films on television are minstrel shows. Yeah. So I think he took it personal. I because of his thing you're talking about. And I was talking about a show, which was not the case at all. So I, I will, we'll have a conversation when we see each other. And what were you saying? Were you saying something like this? Brother, what did you mean when you said that? I'm going to say... What, what did you mean? I mean, there's, there's nothing wrong. For me, the anger I talk about is not the anger that let's burn down the United States, let's other, us overthrow the government. I think anger could be constructive. And if I see a show like The Secret Diary of Desmond Pfeiffer, which was a show about a whole, a sitcom about a Holocaust. Mm -hmm. You know, my ancestors were slaves. I don't think there is anything funny about slavery. So if I voice that opinion, 
is Spike he's angry? Is Spike be angry that a show like this is allowed to be on television? Mm -hmm. But yes. that's an interesting question as to how you go about making this movie. I mean, mm -hmm. it, it, were you, I mean, did you debate how to make your points in the most interesting way that would have the strongest resonance with the audience? Yes, we. You know, how, do you, how do you find the right sort of equilibrium? Well, we thought the tone would be satire, and by that we were going to go all out. So that means in this film, we go after Tommy Hilfiger, Mother Teresa, <laughs> Quincy <laughs> Jones, Oprah Winfrey. And what Diana you, Ross, you went myself, after. <laughs> Quentin Tarantino, the NAACP. No, nobody's above the rage. It's, it's, it's a satire. And, yeah. and if you really look at it, there's nothing in this film that you wouldn't hear Jay Leno saying Monday through Wednesday, every night, on his opening night, my laws of the day show. Have you ever or, been on Oprah? Yeah, we were on for Do the Right Thing. Okay. I mean, but why Me and Joe Klein. <laughs> 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 that was a memorable show. I mean, why about an hour with Spike on Oprah? That'd be good. She likes to keep her ratings up. <laughs> 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 she has a standard to uphold. <laughs> and she does. Yes, she does. Yeah. How about the next? What are they going to be like this year? You sit courtside with us, Charlie, and you know I think Dave Checkett and Sky Layden all respect got bamboozled. Let me just say something. Bamboozled, the title of this film, comes from a great uh, Malcolm X speech right. in which he said black people had been flim-flammed and bamboozled. Flim-flam, led astray, run amok. And so you're saying Dave Checkett and Scott Layden have been bamboozled. Hoodwinked. Hoodwinked, because they got rid of Patrick. Oh, come on. I could not agree with you more. Why? Let me ask a question. Who's going to play center now? I don't... Well, I... <laughs> Whoa, oh, 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 thank you. Thank you, ladies and gentlemen. It's been a good show. <laughs> well, that's a problem. Who's going to... That's a oh, problem. A problem. Oh. That's a huge problem. <laughs> it's a huge problem. <laughs> Luke Lowney gets hurt. Well, Luke can't play. He's hurt. Travis Knight. Felton Spencer. Now, if we get the candidate... Well, let me just... Let okay. Me, let me okay, no, okay. Let me that, that, I... Now, if, now we want to send him. Oh, let's get the Kenbe. David Falkson helped it out. He represents Patrick and Glenn Rice and the Kenbe. So we want to get the Kenbe. Now we gotta use lose Canby, Chris Charles, and either Luttrell or Alan Houston. What are we doing? What's, what are we doing? So who would you trade from the team that exists now for Montempo? I don't think we need him. Well, who's gonna be the center? Patrick is only going to play one season. That was it. They were not going to renew the contract, right? So one what? season. We, so what? We can still win. Miami has no. We could win with Patrick. Yes. How many? How many championships do we win with Patrick? How many? Hey, was show his, me. Was his, how many? Was his fault? Pat Riley kept John Starks in the game, so he's two, two for 19 against Houston. <laughs> no, it was not his fault. And, and four years later, <laughs> Riley finally admits he made that mistake? We, I agree with you. We, we all knew that. I mean, he was having a bad night. He should have jerked him out. Yeah, well, how come it took Pat Riley four years to say, to say he messed up? Because he's not the head coach you are. <laughs> <laughs> no. See, this is what I'm saying. That's what I'm now, saying. Now we need a center. Why, why didn't think about First that First of all, Patrick's going to injure. I guarantee you he'll get injured this year. I guarantee you, he'll be injured and yeah, out of who, the half the season. Yeah, but we didn't think it was going to be before. We didn't think, <laughs> we didn't think Luke Long was going to hurt more Patrick. Okay. Are you, tell me this. If you had a choice between letting either Allen go or Latrell go, who would you let go? Who would you trade? No, we Which? Keep them both. Which? We got to keep them both. Uh, how about Glenn Rice? Are you happy about him? Oh, out. You don't like Glenn Rice? Why? Let me ask a question. I got a lot of friends on the Lakers. <laughs> That's all I'll say. If, you're, if you have a world championship, if your team just wins a ring, yeah. And Jerry West, Cup checked, bus. General managers. Owner. And owner. Right. And Jackson wants you out. Does that tell you something? It tells you that somehow you're not fitting in with the team you've got. And they're happy to see you go. And so they want to make a big trade. That's what it says, isn't it? Now, the Knicks. Is that what it says? The Knicks are built, Is that what it yes, says? The Knicks are built upon defense. Has Glenn Rice ever played defense in his not, career? Well, he didn't play with the Lakers a lot of defense. I'm talking about or at Carolina his or at Miami, career. where? At Miami, Carolina, where? I mean, the... he hasn't played throughout his career. But my guess is they're looking ahead to use him 
How about Chris Weber? Would you like to have Chris Weber? Oh, I would love Chris Weber. Okay, there you go. Suppose we can make this come into a turn where we get Chris Weber to come to the Knicks. How about that? Who we got to go to? Who has to leave, though? Alan. <laughs> Glenn Rice. Hey, I'm not the GM, so right. that's, that's, that's before, ladies and gentlemen, yeah. before, before we came on air, I told, I suggested to Charlie that he bring on Dave Check and, <laughs> and Sky Layden. The, and, the, and, and you said, I'll show up with a ton of questions, right? Now, before God in America, you want to say that if Scott Layden's here, you're going to be here? He's not coming on the show. No, no, no. Either. Don't back out. Don't be wimp yes. out on me. Are yes. you going to be here? Yes. With good questions? At the utmost. <laughs> <laughs> All right. Tell me one more time why America should see Bamboozled. Well, I just think that this is a very entertaining film. At the same time, I acknowledge that we're dealing with the very ugly part of American history. Ugly, but nonetheless, not something that should be buried, you know, in the ground six feet under. Do you think you have the stuff of greatness as a filmmaker? Well, it's something that, all, uh, that I'm always going to try. I think that I've, I've done 15 films in 15 years. Yeah. And when I was in film school, I read a quote by Kara Kurosawa, one of the masters. Yeah, okay, and at the time, Charlie, he was 85 years old. And he said, there's a universe of filmmaking I still, don't, still do not know. And he said that. At 85 years old. You know what I say, man? I say that could, that's the most wonderful thing could possibly happen. If you, and you, the more you know, the more you realize how much there is to know, whether right. it's music or painting so, or, or whatever I'm, it I'm is. I'm dedicated. So you're saying there's a whole lot more. I'm dedicated to getting better every time out and being a better storyteller, better command of my filmmaking skills. For you? Yes. Who are the who are the four or five best filmmakers working today? Forget yourself, you're excluded. Oh, right, of course, I went by myself in that. No, no. Martin Scorsese, I like Oliver Stone. Uh, I love Jim Jarmusch's work. Hmm. Cameron Crowe? I like Cameron. He's coming out, he hadn't made enough films to be great. Yeah, I mean, that's. I'm glad you brought that point up because I think that right today, you do have one good record you write one good play, one good novel, your best thing since sliced bread. I think that you've you got to build up a body of work before you can make intelligent assessments about I agree. No, I think he would and everybody where, else where would. people exactly. stand. Exactly. A lot of people. I mean, that's the same thing with Tiger Woods. As good as he is, and he is the best golfer ever to live, clearly. Well, but you, there's no doubt about Tiger. Well, I know, I know, but what the career's going to look like, you've got to wait and see. He's not. He's going to be, be dominating the next 15 years. You know him? Not really. Not like Michael. I know. <laughs> <laughs> no, he's amazing. He is and amazing. And I think that the, 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 the Williams sisters are going to be... Amazing, too. You know, there. I just think that, Charlie, that we're in a, a wonderful... Despite all the crazy stuff that's going on in the world, this is the most exciting, exciting time to be alive. I do, too. I absolutely do. Mm -hmm. Thank you for coming. Thank you for having me. See you when Scott Layton shows up, all right? <laughs> I'll be here. You better be here.